Uh, welcome everybody to the seven virtual shadowing session. Uh, tonight we are joined by Dr. Peter Antiv and uh, we're going to be focusing on pediatric emergency medicine. So uh, as always, uh, follow us on virtual or follow us on Instagram at virtual shadowing or our YouTube channel pre health virtual shadowing or visit us at our website. So this is our working group. We have Taylor, Alana, Rohit, myself, Shayan, Kiana, uh, Ali, and Aditya. Uh, and then we also have our physician faculty members, of course, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Salazar, Dr. Morchetti, and Dr. Reno. Okay, and so here are some key numbers. Uh, Dr. Fowler, did you wanna to touch on any of these? Yeah, let me uh, take that away for a second, Shayan. Uh, folks, we, virtual shadowing is, and the whole working group has really been quite successful bringing to you what you've needed to prepare yourself for a career in healthcare. Uh, we looked at the numbers this week. We've placed 123 hours of shadowing online for you. To put that in perspective, on the admissions committee at UT Southwestern, of which we've had our fifth meeting of the season already, we look for about 50 to 75 hours of shadowing. So if you will go watch the lectures on virtual shadowing, you'll have the hours you need for your application. Some in-person hours are important, but moreover, we've, we've signed up over 43,000, and actually I think the number is even a tad higher, closer to 45, 47,000 kids from all over the world who want this, these shadowing hours for our 73 sessions that we've done, 72 sessions with 73 tonight, uh, ever since June. Do, do the next slide, would you, Cheyenne? But the thing that's really quite striking about this is that we've had almost a half million viewings of these talks. And so it really seems that virtual shadowing has created a series of programs that will be beneficial to you as a pre-healthcare professional uh, to be able to uh, mark your path as you go forward. And when we looked at the total number of programs versus the number of uh, viewings, We've had almost 850,000 hours of viewing. So this has been a very successful program. We're seeing a lot of students applying to UT Southwestern who are including virtual shadowing hours in their applications. Shion? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and so we do have uh, these upcoming sessions here. So on October 19th, uh, we're gonna be going into uh, a session that's called Inside Emergency Medicine. Uh, and then on October 26th, we're gonna be doing a specialty spotlight in urology. So um, as always throughout this session, whether you're watching from YouTube or Zoom, feel free to enter your uh, or type your questions into the chat and we will get to them during the question and answer sessions, one in the middle and one at the very end. So I will let Dr. Antivy take it from here with his slides. Okay. You guys ready for me? We're take it away. Okay. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the team from the virtual pre-medicine shadowing team. Uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Fowler and I go back a little ways. I got to meet the rest of the team over the last uh, month or so. And let me tell you, these are some hardworking people. So you know, from uh, Aditya, Shayan, um, Ali, Taylor, uh, and the rest of the gang who, who put this together. This is just incredible stuff. Um, my name is Peter Antevi. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician down here in South Florida. I see on the chat that there's a lot of uh, Floridians there. So shout out to my fellow Floridians. And I have, I have um, a, a very um, uh, kind of curved path in medicine, if you will. And what I wanted to do is start off with uh, my origin story, which is something that I, I really have never publicly said. Um, I, I've only told, I've only, you know, given part of the story uh, two other times in the last uh, year. And so a lot of the information you'll hear today is personal, um, but hopefully you'll learn a little bit about me and, and learn kind of, you know, why, why I am who I am and why I do what I do. Um, uh, just, just um, if you guys are reading the very bottom of my um, of this slide here, you'll see that you know I started in pediatrics, I went into pediatric emergency medicine, and then my career took a complete turn in 2010, 
And that's part of the story that you'll hear today. It actually took two different turns in the same year. So two, two things happened to me that really took me very completely a right turn away from um, everything I was doing and I trained to do. So hopefully there are people out there who are listening today who are wondering what a career in medicine looks like, what a career in pediatric emergency medicine looks like. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll see that one person, one thing, one event can change your career for, for the better. Um, and that medicine is not a straight path. If, if you see medicine as a straight path, you'll end up hitting the ceiling, right? There, there'll be a glass ceiling. If, you, if you're just going to do the same thing on day one, um, as you're going to do at the day that you retire, um, I think that, I think that you're missing out on some major opportunities. And so hopefully with hearing my story, which, um, there's a lot of luck involved, I would have to say. Um, you'll, you'll see yourself, hopefully, in, in, in me, um, uh, who I am the ultimate underdog, right? So if you're listening to this from another country or you couldn't make it into medical school the first time around, um, you're talking to the same guy right here. And so I'm excited to talk about my story. And, and I know Ray uh, and, the, and the team, please jump in anytime and, uh, and stop me. And I know there'll be um, questions coming into the chat. What I want to do is start off with a video. And um, th this video is really encompasses what pediatric emergency medicine physician does and what EMS does. And so as you hear my story unfold today, you'll recognize that I've worked in the hospital for 20 years. I've worked in the pre-hospital, similar to Dr. Fowler. Um, I've only been doing it for, for 11 years, but I've learned that those two uh, locations of medicine have to work together. And this first video is a recreation. And um, actually, I wanna make sure that I, uh, that I have the sound coming through here. So I'm gonna reshare real quick, sorry. Yep, the sound is gonna come through. Um, th this is a video of kind of where things start and how EMS and people like me and, and the nurses I work with uh, would, would get involved. So let's show you this short video. James, where are you? Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, good. How's Kenny? How did you disappear so fast? James? Oh, you know, kids. James? Is he doing anything for school? Are you yet? out here? James? We had a kid drown in the hot tub. James, James, can you hear me? Okay, so um, I, I, I would hope I would hope that that that, that video is it, it's more than likely I mean, it still raises my heart rate when I see this video and I've seen it a million times. And the reason it does is because what happens right at that moment, right from from second number one that you just saw this kid get pulled out of the hot tub. What, what happens over the course of the next 10 to 15 minutes, which includes what mom and dad do, what the telephone operator at 911 dispatch center does, what EMS does, and then what the hospital does, all of those folks will take part in the survival of little James. And I, I was so naive, so naive. You know, I, I trained at you know, two of the top five children's hospitals. I thought that I knew everything. And then I realized how little I really did know that um, it really takes a village. It's what we call the chain of survival, but there's a lot more to the story that I would like to take you through uh, as we go through. Now, part of, part of this is, is therapy for me because what, what I now uh, tell people 
is that in, uh, which is things that I never used to tell people before, but uh, in 2005, I made a tenfold medication error. And I'll never forget, it was room number four in the pediatric ER. Um, child was five years old or so. Uh, she was, she had a peanut, she was swelling, wheezing, the, the, the classic, what we know as anaphylaxis, like that picture on the left. And a nurse comes up to me and says, anaphylaxis in room four, uh, she showed me what the dose should be. And I said, I agreed. And I gave this girl 2.1 mLs of the life-saving medication called epinephrine when she only needed 0.2 mLs. Now, remember, this is right after I had gone through four years of medical school, three years of pediatric residency, three years of pediatric emergency medicine fellowship. All right, I was supposed to be super trained I was supposed to be the guy who can figure this simple thing out, but I got it wrong. This girl's heart rate went to about 230, which is very high. She wasn't looking well. Uh, her wheezing went away and her hives went away and her lip swelling went away. Um, and I did not realize that I had given her tenfold more than I should have. We kept her in the hospital that night because her heart rate didn't go down for quite some time. I uh, gave her steroids and all the other things we do. And um, I thought I did a good job. I only learned about my mistake in 2010 when I became an EMS medical director and I saw the same mistake happening over and over and over again. Then I saw the same similar mistakes happening with pain control. This girl, another child with a femur fracture, we give a medication called fentanyl to pain control. We were giving significant overdoses of that in, in the field. And even worse, we had kids in the back of our ambulance who were actively seizing where two mistakes were being made. Number one, we weren't giving medication. That's called an, uh, an error of omission. And then when we were giving the medication, we were giving significant overdoses. It's called an error of commission. So here I am. Just imagine now, 2010, I've been doing this for five years, and now I'm being bombarded with significant medication to overdoses over and over and over again. And um, as someone who had made those mistakes, I said to myself, this is, this is a major problem. How could it be that, that this is happening? Um, and that, that's kind of, this is just really to give you the 30,000 foot view of uh, of, uh, of where my, my heart is and, and why, how I ended up there, right? So um, you'll, you'll learn in a little bit that I, I ended up starting a company, um, and, but you'll, you'll quickly find out uh, about me a few things, which is uh, that, that I'm very passionate about this topic of, of pediatric, of any critical care in pediatrics, I'm very passionate about it. But I, I do have a, a few disclaimers at, at the very beginning that are important. Number one is I don't like business. I hate it, hate business. So if you're looking at the anti-business person here, um, but you'll realize that sometimes in your life, um, the only way to make something continue and to actually help save other kids and adults is to actually have an engine behind it that helps you grow. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, money is not a driver for me. So we, we grew up, I would say lower middle class. We used to go uh, vacation and my parents could get one room with a double bed and my three brothers and I, so it's four of us would sleep on the floor. Um, and we would all share the, the pillows and we would just make it happen. But it was, we had an amazing childhood but I, I was never driven by money. Um, and so when you own a business and you're not driven by money, uh, those two things don't connect by the way. Um, I never wanted to start a company uh, ever. And that was never my intention. And you, you'll hear about my family in a little bit, but that, that wasn't really me. Um, but I was the guy when I, when I was in, um, in residency in Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, um, I always found myself wanting to go down to the first floor. That's where the emergency department was. And um, even in medical school, when there was a procedure to be had or you know, anything, I was always at the head of the bed. So I knew very early on that 
the basics weren't good enough for me. I wanted to be there for the most critical thing. So that, that, that I knew about myself. Um, but like I told you, I recognized things weren't right because I made those mistakes um, after being what I thought was very well trained. Um, and so I, right around that time, um, at around 2008, 2009 into 2010, um, I would come to the emergency department very stressed. And people who know me know that, that there's not a stressful bone in my body. I don't I mean, um, my wife doesn't like it because um, the kids go to her for all their problems because they know that it won't really move me, right? <laughs> um, but th this one thing I knew that I, I, I was incompetent in the emergency department as a well-trained physician that I was worried, what if the next kid comes in in cardiac arrest? And then the next kid comes in and um, the nurses started coming to me and they were a little concerned because in the code room, I, wasn't, I was not performing up to par. I knew that, they knew that. Um, so there came a time in my career where I started losing sleep. I would wake up in the middle of the night, I was sweating. Um, all these ideas were coming to me when I was sleeping and I would wake my wife up in the middle of the night and when she said, go back to bed. And I said, you know what? I can't go back to bed. Um, and God bless my wife, but she, she's really um, a significant reason for the things, for the successes that I've had. Um, and so she, she does get a lot of the credit, but I was truly losing sleep, um, you know, just a few years into my real job here at a level one trauma center at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, which is right here in Hollywood, Florida, which is next to Fort Lauderdale. And so what, where I want to start with my origin story is, is this, uh, you know, and now that I have two dogs and you may hear them barking every once in a while, um, they're two little puppies, but um, I, I was always the underdog. And I, I mentioned that a little earlier before we started. And um, now that I look back at, at, at how my brain operates and, and the way that I look at the world, you know, I recognize that, um, being, being the underdog when, when you're trying to solve big problems is a good thing because when, when, when people think you're crazy and people think that there's no way that he's going to do that, um, they tend to kind of just um, disregard for, for some time and they keep disregarding. And then over time, you can finally make a change. So if, if you're out there listening today and, and, and you're like me, like this little guy and there's all these big dogs around you, um, you know, uh, have faith and continue the passion and continue what you're doing because over time it does pay off. And, and I'm, I'm very blessed to have a mentor like Dr. Fowler, um, who I met through Dr. Paul Pepe. Um, th these, these, these men are, are, are the giants and it's their backs that people like me are standing on, quite frankly. Um, and so there are people out there that will believe in you. Um, you have to find mentors that will say, you know what, that idea is a good idea. You continue that and you'll, and you'll make something of yourself one day. Oh. So uh, a little bit about my family, because this is kind of an important part of the story, is that um, my, my family uh, immigrated here from Israel many years ago, um, probably now uh, 60 years <laughs> ago. But what, what, what it turns out when, when, when I asked the our relatives about the real history of what happened. It turns out that my grandfather's family lived in um, what is now considered Mosul, Iraq, right? You've heard of Mosul, right? And they, they had to escape uh, for, for fear of persecution many years ago. And, and back in uh, the 1920s, before, the, before Israel was even a state, my, my grandfather, they, they left Iraq on donkeys and they, they, they went through Damascus, Syria, and they ended up in a place called Palestine. Uh, and again, this is my grandfather. This is not someone who's like many generations. I mean, he raised me, um, ended up in Palestine and founded a, a, a little city called Yoknam, which is still there today, um, and then helped Israel become a state. So uh, my, my grandfather, again, this all happened in 1948, so it's not too long ago, for, for at least for me anyway. Um, and you know, that, 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 that was something that was important. And it's funny, we just had a family reunion, uh, the other day on Sunday and someone blew up this picture. So I took a picture of it on my iPhone. My grandfather is the guy in the middle. 
This is Palestine when they moved, when, when they left back and came into Israel and they landed in Palestine, this is them right here. And they had nothing, right? My grandfather's father to all of these children, father is dead by now, okay? He died uh, in, his, uh, um, in his early 40s. So now you have kids who are being raised uh, just by their mother. And my grandfather being one of the older ones, basically had to carry a gun, make sure that the village was safe and, and so on and so on. Uh, to speed the story up a little bit, they, they ended up becoming uh, builders and uh, they, they built buildings. And my grandfather over time uh, became as what was considered wealthy in Israel, turns out. Um, but the kind of person that he is, he said, you know what? I want, I want more from, for the family. And, and, and this is my grandfather, may he rest in peace. And these are my, my, uh, uh, my three other brothers. And here's my grandmother on the right. So I'm, I'm the one here on the right. My grandfather, you could see, was a, he was a beast, right? Um, this is the guy who had it all in Israel and for some reason said, let's get on a boat and let's go there to America, right? So think of if you were somewhere right now and you had it all, right? You're living on you know, the best house and you had the best job and you can go on vacation, whatever you want. Would you today leave for another country? But at, at the same time, you're leaving on a boat across the Atlantic so first he went with his brothers. He wanted to evaluate, got to New York City, said, looks good. Went back on the boat two weeks and said, family, we're going. And he took everything, right? And so they sold everything and they land in Newark, New Jersey. Now he's a builder. And I think I have a photo up here of, 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 of the boat. So this is the QE2. So, you know, basically um, they, they literally came across to America on a boat. Get, they get to Newark. They put all their money into building um, an assisted living facility in Newark, New Jersey. They didn't speak a lick of English. And uh, it turned out because of eminent domain and there was some permitting issues, the rug was pulled out from under them. They went bankrupt and they lost everything. Now they're back to zero, complete zero. My grandfather doesn't complain. He said, you know what, let's go to Brooklyn. They go to Brooklyn, it becomes, he learns how to cut, cut plastic slip covers Make a long story short, they end up in Florida. Why am I telling you all this? Is because they keep getting banged down and down and down, but they keep going forward and forward and forward. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit because I wanna talk, tell you about my dad, who was a farmer in Israel, meets my mom. When my mom went back to Israel, they come back to America. And my dad has zero education. My dad does not have a high school degree. Okay, and may he rest in peace. My dad unfortunately passed away last year. Um, so here's this is him. This is him as a youngster, and he he comes across to America and he he learns how to cut plastic slip covers, and and basically now he's got four children, and he's making nothing, right? Um, and but again, growing up, never heard the man complain. Never heard my mom complain. It was just, it is what it is. We're going to keep on moving forward. And he became an upholsterer. He let a couch had a rip in it. That was my dad. You wanted vertical blinds, you, you call my dad. And he was just an amazing, amazing person. Um, so why do I tell you that whole story? Because I went to University of uh, Florida as an undergrad. And I was the guy who was trying to coach all these kids to try to get into medical school, thinking that Peter and Tevi is going to get into medical school. Well, guess what? I didn't. I got... I think I applied to 10 schools thinking, of course, someone's going to take me. And I got 10 rejection letters. So what did I do? Um, you know, I called my parents. I'm like, what am I going to do? And they said, take another year, you know, do, do another like a gap year, as, as you guys call it. And I, I, I did that. And then halfway through, I'm like, you know what? Someone told me about this school in the Caribbean. And when I told it to my parents, they're like, Caribbean, you're not going to the Caribbean. This is, you know, who, who does that? Um, and I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going. I'm going. And, um, my, you know, I, I applied. I did an interview. And they accepted me. And I said, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, Grenada, uh, which is just north of uh, Venezuela. If anyone, it's in the Lesser Antilles chain. Uh, very small island. Beautiful you know, uh, beautiful scenery. And, and I, I go to Grenada 
And uh, it turns out to be the best two years of my life. But there's, there's a couple of stories that I want to talk about. This is how St. George's University looks today, but surely didn't look that way when I went there. Um, this, is, this is literally one of the most beautiful medical schools you'll ever go to. You can see the runway right behind. That's the main runway into Grenada. And um, back when I was there, we, we had some really, really bad. I mean, one, of the, one or two of these buildings have been built in this picture, but uh, th this is more like where I went. <laughs> uh, the building behind you used to be a motel. They converted it into student dormitories, but the beauty of it, it was right on the beach. Now, why am I telling you this story? Uh, just to kind of take you a little bit into my history. When we used to go get mail, there was no internet back then. There was a mail room and we used to go to the mail room and there was a line at lunch for mail. And it took about an hour, hour and a half to get the mail. And I would go up to the window and say, Peter and Tevi, and they would, they, would, they would look through one piece of mail at a time and they would find my mail and bring it to me. And I said, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, why, why are we doing it this way? And I said, we've been doing this here for 20 years. So um, I became the class president and I said, you know what? I have an idea. I saw one of the rooms in that old hotel that wasn't being used and I convinced the Dean to let me modify it a little bit. So he, he allowed me to really tear down one of the walls of, the, of, of that room. And we, we actually built an entire uh, sliding glass window with a, you know, you can kind of open and close it. And then I had him build mail slots. Now I don't have the picture of that, unfortunately, but I'll show you kind of something similar. So, this wasn't the room, <laughs> but, but we, we actually had built mail slots that every student would come in. And then we ended up hiring the spouses of the students. And we had a fax machine. If you wanted to type out a fax to somebody, yes, we used faxes back then. Um, and we, we started selling things out of there. So we kind of created this own, our own little business. And um, I thought nothing of it. I mean, uh, there was no fanfare behind this. But looking back, um, it, you know, uh, now, that, now that I kind of know more of who, who I am, um, the, the, this is the kind of person I am. I see a problem that seems pretty, pretty big problem that you want to fix, yeah, you fix it, right? Um, without, without any concern for how difficult that, that may be, right? Tear down a wall, uh, we can convince people to do that. Now, um, I was very, very fortunate that um, after two years in Grenada, that I was able to transfer to the University of Miami. And, you know, again, um, there, there, there's an entire story behind this that I, I'm not gonna go into only because we don't have a lot of time today together. But um, th this story of me just thinking that the University of Miami, I had great grades, class president, they're gonna take me. Well, it turns out that they want nothing to do with me. Um, so what did I do? I took a board course for the step one of the boards at UM. And I decided I would sit outside the Dean's office until she went to lunch. And uh, she went to lunch one day and I said, Dean Canterbury, uh, you know, Peter and Tevi here. She said, I don't know you. I said, yes, I know that. I know you don't know me. Um, we, we started chatting up a conversation and next thing you know, she brought me back into her office. And um, I said, you know, I would love to transfer. She says, we don't take transfers. But I was a class president, I don't care but I have great grades, we don't care. And um, I'm not sure what happened during that conversation, but, she, but something turned around and she says, hey, you know what, I like you kid, go get a good score on your boards and I'll consider taking you. And boy, I mean, uh, talk about pressure. Um, I, went, I went and really studied hard for my board exams and I got a great score on my boards. And um, that year the board exam got stolen. Someone had stolen the board exam, so there was very big delay. And I had planned on now going to New York City where it would be my clinical rotations. Um, and I called the secretary the day before I left and I said, I have to see the Dean because I'm starting school tomorrow in New York. She says, the Dean won't see you. So what did I do? I drove my car back to the Dean and I waited outside her office again. And she went to lunch and I said, hey Dean, remember me? And she said, yeah, I remember you. And she brought me back into her office and she, she says, um, wait two weeks and you'll hear from me. And long story short, she, I ended up getting a phone call from, from Dean Canterbury um, and they accepted me into the University of Florida. The reason I'm telling you that story is, 
is because many of you are going to get rejection letters. Many of you are going to be told that you're not good enough. Many of you are not going to have the scores, perhaps, that the person next to you has. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. All that matters is, is that you have, have passion and that you'll open any door, any door that, that is locked or unlocked. Maybe you have to pick the lock to get through it. You have to make it happen. No one's going to come and give you anything on a silver platter. And I know how hard is it, it is today because, you know, I get a lot of students coming to me asking me to do research with me and uh, to do an internship with me and so forth. So um, never give up on your dream. I don't care if it takes you 10 years to figure it out, go for it. If, if, if that's what you wake up in the morning wanting to do, do it. That's, that's the, the, the moral of that story. So um, graduated from the University of Miami. And remember, I came from a, a family who my dad was an upholsterer. My mom was a travel agent. Um, I have two brothers. One, one was in architecture school, struggling. My other brother was in, in going to uh, civil engineering, struggling. So, of course, this was the day where it was our son, the doctor. Okay. So, this was a very big day in my family that uh, I, you know, I graduated from the University of Miami um, and, and um, I ended up going to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Um, great, great program. Um, by the way, just as an FYI, they didn't want to take me either. Why? Even though I graduated near the top of my class, at University of Miami, they said, you came from a foreign medical school. Therefore, you are in the throwaway bin. How did I know that? Because I called up the secretary and I made friends with the secretary over the phone. And she said, I hate to tell you, but they haven't even looked at your application and they never will. And I, you know, I called her back a few more times and she said, you know what? I'm gonna put you in the other bin. She says, are you free August 11th? I said, yes, I am. She says, you, you, you know what? I got you an interview. And then it turns out what I didn't know that that secretary, Peggy, they give Peggy one vote. Whoever she wants out of the entire interview class, she gets that one person. And I happen to be Peggy's choice that year. So no one can say no because Peggy had that choice. And so that one person is another person who changed my life and then uh, enabled me then to go to Children's of Pittsburgh, which I never would have gotten into for Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellowship because it's, it's one of the top programs in the country. Um, and they took me, why? Because I went to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And so the, 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 the moral of this entire story is that, um, you know, it's not about what's on the paper, it's what's about what's in your heart and what you know that you're meant to do in, in your career. So um, hopefully I can, I, I've impressed upon you that. Um, I was fortunate enough in 2005 to uh, then get my first real job as a pediatric ER doctor. And for those of you who are, who are thinking, hey, what does is, what is someone like that do? And what, what does that career look like? I guess I'll take a few minutes. When you're um, an emer any emergency physician, your, your, your career is now working in an emergency department and um, they, they vary from level one trauma center where you know, kind of all the big bad stuff comes in to an outline community center, uh, an outline community emergency department where you're taking care of people in a community, but you may have to then transfer people out to maybe um, the larger center that has maybe more uh, subspecialists. Um, but I, I've worked my entire career at these larger facilities, similar to a Parkland where Dr. Fowler works. And um, that, that, that consists of doing shifts where the shift is either eight, 10 or 12 hours long. Um, but I routinely only did 12 hour shifts. The requirement uh, for this type of work is that you do a minimum number of shifts per month. So you can get a certain number of hours. And in my case, it was 144. That adds up to 12 shifts a month. You could do the math, 12 shifts. There's 30 days in a month. It seems like an amazing career, and it is. Okay, so pediatric ER is an incredible place where you're treating the sickest of the sick, and you're helping children come back to life. And you're also treating people who are just nervous and scared, first-time mothers, uh, people who have a hook stuck in their finger or, uh, you know, you name it, we see it. The best job in the world. And I, um, 
you know, the reason I love that career is because of the, of the quick relationship you have to make with the family, connection with the family, so that the child trusts you. Then you have to have the ability to see that the child has something wrong, even if the parent may not know it yet. And then the other side of it, if the parent thinks something's really wrong and something's not really wrong, you have to be able to turn them around and sail the ship in the other direction to say, hey, I know you're nervous and I feel, I feel you're nervous, but don't worry, I got you. Um, th this is why I think things are going to be okay. And, and a lot of times you're rolling the dice, right? Because um, if, if, if you're an attorney out there, uh, clearly there, the, there's case books full of uh, that child being sent home and something bad happening to them. And the first person they'll blame is you, right? Because you're the person who sent them home. And now, now you have only a document to stand behind to say, um, I thought I did everything right, but clearly I missed something. So if you're, if you're unable to live with uncertainty, don't go into emergency medicine, right? Uh, uh, we are the people who live with uncertainty but you have to have enough confidence to and, and know the data and be able to have a brain that can kind of synthesize clinical and what's in the data and know how to perform whatever test you have to perform. At the same time, you have to look cool as a cucumber and give confidence to the parents that you are the person for the job. All those things I love to do. And um, it's why I would never choose any other career. If I had to do it all over again, for me, it's a thousand times I would go into pediatric emergency medicine. I, I think I was built for that. Um, and, I, and I really, really enjoy uh, my career. And this is just a wonderful hospital with, with just amazing people in it. Peter, did, did, did you know it as a teenager or in, in college? Yeah. I mean, did you already know that about kids or was that something that came later? So it turns out I have a yearbook, an elementary school yearbook. Someone gave it to me, my Aunt Barbara. Um, and she says, Pete, did you ever know that in your elementary school yearbook, when they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And by the way, the picture of me was on a tricycle, Ray. <laughs> okay. And it said underneath, wants to be pediatrician. So um, I, I guess there, there's someone upstairs telling me what to do in life because that person keeps pushing me in different directions. And um, you know, it, it just seems to be getting better and better, knock on wood. Um, but, but yes, that, that it was something that I knew from, from, from the very beginning, even though my parents tried to steer me away, and my, my parents always said, always work for yourself. And I said, mom, I, I mean, if you're an, if you're an ER doctor, I'm never working for myself. Right. Uh, or so I thought, um, okay. So been in Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital since 2005. And here we are in 2021, uh, but, I, but I told you that in 2010, um, so, something happened in my career that, that really changed. Um, just so everyone kind of gets a sense of, of, of what the emergency department is, there's one room in every emergency department that looks like this. And in Parkland, there's probably 10 rooms <laughs> that look like this. Um, but this is the trauma room, the code room. Um, this is the place where I love to live, right? So um, put me in this room all day long. Don't ever let me see a patient that has nothing wrong with them. And th this is where Peter and Tevi loves to be. It, it turns out that in pediatrics, most people don't want to be in this room. So you can imagine that I found myself trying to bring people into this room to have the fun that I was having and the joy that was I was having from helping the really sick kid and nobody wanted to be in the room with me. Nurses were walking out, uh, hoping that another nurse would walk in. And so what I started to do, I, I, I said, every month we're gonna meet in this room for four hours and we're gonna go through cases, cases and more and I, students and paramedic students and the more people in there, the better. And lo and behold, after some time, I turned the entire nursing staff around so that when the code came in, we had more people in the room than we could fit and we started to kick people out, right? So, um, you know, th this, this, is, this is a learned skill. Um, you know, if you're out there thinking, oh my God, everything he's saying is stressing me out, um, then 
we're always, there's always some uh, bit of stress in you, right? Your heart rate always goes up. Um, don't, don't think that like I'm some kind of robot or Dr. Fowler. I mean, we, we, just, en- we just enjoy being in these situations. It's kind of how, it's, it's, I guess it's how we are, but you'll, you'll find less of the Dr. Fowler type in the pediatric realm. Most people in pediatrics really don't like the critical stuff. Um, and, and I learned early on that um, that, that was the case. Um, but I, I could tell you that um, when, when, when you feel that you don't know what you're doing because of the dosing and the medical errors that you were doing, um, all of a sudden it becomes unsafe and unhealthy. So if you're a nurse listening to this today um, and you have worked in the pediatric ER or you will work in the pediatric ER, uh, it turns out that where you work, how you train, how they teach you especially when it comes around pediatric codes, you'll find yourself very, very quickly saying that there's two types of nurses. Uh, ones who come in in year one, they're gone. And then the other ones who come in and they stay for their entire career. So go to any pe- children's hospital, go to the pediatric ER, and you'll find 30 year nurses, a group of them. And then you'll find the first and second year nurses. And there's very little in between. And, 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 um, and I think there's some things that we can do about that. That's a whole nother talk. But I think that the pediatric ER could be stressful for you if you haven't gotten the right training, if the system is not good there, um, or if you don't understand the basics of why kids are stressful, and which is something that I'm, I wanna get into in, in the second half of this later, later uh, this talk today. Um, so I, I was very stressed. I told you that I was making medication errors. I was in the code room. I wasn't feeling comfortable because this guy, Robert Hickey, I call him Bob. Bob is, was my mentor at Children's of Pittsburgh. And when we had a code in, in, in Children's, Bob would just, all the doses he would know like that, the rolling off of his tongue, tube sizes, drip doses. I mean, he knew it all. Um, and, and he, again, Bob is, is one of the authors of, of the guidelines. Uh, he's, one, he's the second author of the uh, original PALS textbook and the PALS guidelines. So I called up Bob and I said, Bob, here I am. I just left you guys. And I come into my code room and they're giving me a length-based tape. And in Pittsburgh, we never had this length-based tape. In LA, we never used a length-based tape. They had it, but it was somewhere hidden away. And and basically, when a child would come in who's in cardiac arrest, you would lay down this tape, and wherever the feet landed, there was doses there. And this was a genius idea created by a gentleman named Jim Broslow. Remember that name. Jim Broslow, Dr. Broslow, was a family medicine practitioner in North Carolina, and he says, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to give a one-year-old versus a five-year-old versus a nine-year-old. He figured out that if you, if you measure the kid and you lay this tape next to them and wherever their feet showed up, he now had a list of about 45 different drugs and then you can quickly learn the dose. Bob, on the other hand, didn't do that. Bob, on the other hand, used age. He said, one-year-old, I got it. Three-year-old, I got it. He didn't use length, he used age. So when I came to Joe DiMaggio and they gave me a, a length-based tape, That's when I made that first tenfold error on that five-year-old girl because I'd never seen the tape. The nurse showed me the dose and I said, it looks right to me. And it turns out it was incorrect. So um, I said to Bob, I said, what am I going to do? He says, dude, then I don't know, man. He's like, we're done. I mean, I can't help you. So what did I do? It was a Sunday morning and I took a piece of paper out and I said, "Let let me see if I can get Bob Hickey streaming through Peter and Tevi here. I said, Bob used ages. So I, I started scribbling all these ages and I finally got to one, three, five, seven, and nine. And then there's all these formulas out there for the, how to figure out the weight of a child in kilograms based on their age. And I, I did a lot of research. And finally, I came down to 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 kilograms. And I said, okay, that's pretty good. And then I started writing down just a few medications that we need in the code room, in the resuscitation room. And I wrote these drugs, epi. There's two types of epi, we'll go into it later. Amiodarone, bicarb, dextrose on the left, those are the medication. 
And then I did the calculation for the dose as a volume, not the dose per kilogram and doing all this math. I said, if the nurse asked me for how much medication to drop in a syringe, what would it be? So let's just take a look at that one-year-old 10 kilo kid. You could see that it was, there was a pattern. The pattern showed up that was a decimal dance, right? For the first four drugs anyway. And I said, oh my God, I, this can't be this easy. So I folded up this piece of paper after I memorized it and I put it in my pocket and, the, and everything changed for me. Everything changed. I went into the emergency room, into the emergency department and our next code came in and boom, I was at the head of the bed. I, I, I looked confident, I sounded confident. And I said, one-year-old epi, one to 10,000, one ml. Amiodarone, let's drop one ml. Bicarb, let's get 10 ml. And all of a sudden the nurses all looked at me and they said, what happened to you? Like, okay, now, now he's, he's present, he's here. Um, and so all the, and, and so the nurses kept asking me, Pete, what happened to you? How did you get better suddenly? And I said, ah, it's just a little trick that I started doing. Um, and I, I, I was embarrassed to tell them what I did. I kept it a secret for a couple of years. So long story short, um, in 2009, a nurse, Maricar, another person who changed my life. She said, Pete, you're giving a lecture next, uh, next week on pediatric drowning. Can you teach that little trick? I said, sure. So I, I put two slides at the end of my talk. And I said, at the very end of my talk, I said, I, I taught everyone how to do it on my hands. And I had the whole crowd going. And, and all of a sudden I see all these lights, these eyes lighting up. And the talk was over and I thanked everybody. And next thing you know, about 50 people of the 200 were standing in line. And I said, is there food behind me? <laughs> and, and I thought, was the talk that good? And every one of them just wanted my last two slides. And I said to myself, oh boy, it's not just me. So I came home to my wife and I said, I said, hon, I, you know, I'm not sure what to do here. Uh, this, this, this is something that everybody needs, not, not just me. So I ended up, Thanks to my wife, going to my computer, um, taking a picture of my hand. <laughs> I did not know I, that. Was, I did not know yeah. that was your hand, Peter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're we're talking low budget, red. And uh, this this is all done on a Mac. You you could still see the inconsistencies. Like if you look very closely, you could see this was done very rudimentary um, by by me. <laughs> um, I went to Kinko's. I I laminated it. And I, and I put it on my badge, I get to work. And now someone says to me, I need that. that, that that's what you taught on the left. I said, yeah. So I gave, away, I gave away the badge buddy. I went and made a few more. Next, I come to work and literally however many I had were gone, right? People were coming down from the OR, they were coming from anesthesia, paramedics. And next thing you know, I started getting uh, asked around the country to give this talk about this five thing, five hand thing. I started printing up thousands and thousands of these cards and everywhere I would go, just give them away for free. And thousands of people, I'm getting phone calls from Nevada saying, I just saved the kid because that little card you gave me. And I said, wow, that's incredible. Right? So now the story continues. So I go to my brothers. Now, by this time, my two older brothers had started a company and, um, Early on, they were struggling. My parents had to send them money. Um, you know, uh, they had to send them care packages with peanut butter and jelly and bread. I'm not kidding you. And, uh, but now a few years have gone by and, and now my brothers, you know, they had, um, they, they were developing software and they were doing pretty well. So I, I, I take them to lunch and I said, listen, I've developed a little badge buddy. And um, it seems like, People around the country want this thing. And my brother said to me, Pete, don't waste your time. Because if no one's going to buy anything from you, this business will never grow and you're wasting your time. So you're either going to just go continue to do your little lecture, print out these badge buddies, give them away or charge a quarter or a dollar or five dollars. But basically, you're, you're, you're talking to the wrong people. So what did I do? I went home and I did exactly the opposite because I couldn't sleep because I knew that there, was a, that there was a problem. So I went to my chief, God bless Julie Downey, fire chief of Davy Fire Rescue. 
I just became the medical director and I said, chief, what would I tell you if I, if I said to you that um, our medics are making mistakes on this length-based tape because it doesn't follow our protocols? She says, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, would you come down? We have a, a whole crew downstairs waiting for us. Would you mind coming down and taking a look? And we started giving our medics, our best medics scenarios, and they were making tenfold errors like I made. Threefold errors of fentanyl, threefold errors of midazolam. And the chief said to me, I can't, I can't believe what I'm seeing. She says, you have the green light to do whatever you want to do. I said, fine. So I went to, I went to Kinko's again. I went to my laptop and I said, let me have all the drugs in our protocol. So in EMS, we have a protocol. It's very standardized. We have a drug box. So I could take all the drugs we had and I could look at the protocol and I could make one of these for every age. And I did. I went to Kinko's and I laminated it and I, I bound it. And, I, and Chief Downey said, go ahead, do it. And I said, by the way, um, maybe we'll make a little kit for, for equipment that goes by age two. And she says, whatever you want, just go do it. So um, I, went in, I went out and bought one of these little boxes called a Pelican box, a Pelican, it was a 1550. And um, word got out in, in, in Miami that there was this pediatric guy who figured out this little badge buddy thing and they wanted me to come and give a little presentation. So I did. This is Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. And um, they put me into a room full of chiefs. Uh, now this, doesn't, this is just a video of uh, an image from Google. So that's, this is in Philadelphia. <laughs> Ray probably recognizes uh, some people in here. Yeah, yeah Crawford. Right, Crawford, right. So I go mm -hmm. into, this, into this small room in, in Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. There's about six medical directors. There's about 10 fire chiefs. And there's a, and there's a, a couple EMS uh, chiefs. And I have a yellow box and I have a little book and a badge buddy. And I said to the chief, chief, what if you bring me your assist, your administrative assistant? And then I said, is there anyone in here with a pediatric pro? And one of the chiefs raised his hand. He's like, I'm pal's expert. So I brought the chief up and I brought his, the assistant up. And I said to the assistant, have you ever treated a kid before? She's like, I'm not even in medicine. I said, so you've never seen a patient. You've never met me. She says, no. And I look at the, the EMS guy and I said, okay, you're ready to do four cases. So I said, I want the dose for, for four. I want four different drug doses. And I had a stopwatch and I said, go. The assistant opened the book. She looked at the age and she rattled off four doses within about 12 seconds. The chief, on the other hand, using the other tool that they were using, couldn't get one dose right. He made three overdoses and the fourth drug he just gave up on. And I knew this was going to happen because I had done it in my department. So I, I kind of figured this, this was going to happen. So all the jaws were on the floor and I, and the chief says, okay, thanks doc. You can, you can go now. I get in my car, call my wife. She says, how'd it go? I said, I think it went pretty good. And I get a phone call 10 minutes later and they said, we'll take 200 of those. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, 200 of what? Well, 200 boxes and we want the books and the whole thing. So all right, there was, I called my wife again and I said, hon, we, we got to do something. She's like, I'll handle it. Um, and then she says, you know, she says, you know, you have to start a business now. I said, how do I do that? Um, and so now, now you see how I ended up. Um, so that so the, I guess the moral of my personal story is that there's a yin and a yang, right? There's people like me and like us. So most of you listening to this call um, are probably not business people. Um, there's a rare doctor who's very good at business. They're a needle in a haystack. Okay. So there's me. And it turns out that my wife is tremendous, tremendous at putting organizations together, knowing what to do next, leading the charge, having big teams of people. My wife used to work at the White House. My wife, my wife used to work at NBC. Uh, she, she worked in the highest levels of government. She knows what she's doing when it comes to organization. I, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. Um, and so I, I was very fortunate. I married up. Okay. So um, if, if you're out there, you're a physician founder, and many of you out there, your nurses, your PAs, your paramedics, I get people call me all the time now saying, 
hey, I have an idea. And I heard that you have put ideas into action. <laughs> and they say, what do I do? I said, you got to go marry someone who knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, so if you really want to read a good book um, about, about um, you know, ideas, read, read this book. It's called, it, it takes you about two hours to read the whole book. Um, it's about ideas and which, which ideas make it and which don't. Um, you, you're probably the person who has the vision. You should be the person who knows the science. And at the end of the day, um, this is as far as I got, right? I went onto my laptop, my Mac, and I made this. And then basically I was clueless, helpless after that. Um, so don't think that just because you have an idea that it's going to become a big idea, you have to find the people who will help you make it that idea. So just as an example, what you guys are doing right now with this virtual shadowing is a humongous idea, humongous. 500,000 people uh, viewing this stuff. I mean, this is a big idea, right? And, and I think that just kudos to you guys for getting it to where it's come. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna further the story just cause I wanna finish here at the top of the hour and give everyone a quick break and then we'll go into the next section is that I, I ended up years after starting the, the company uh, now about five years ago, creating an app and now, and, and, and the app then now rolls into, um, it integrates with other medical records. And um, now we have an entire team of people who build this app and uh, fast forward, for those first five years of the business, all my colleagues thought I was crazy. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Ray, if you remember, you were not kind enough to invite me many years ago when I was just a guy with a yellow box and an idea. You gave me that opportunity to come speak to the Biotel uh, in Dallas. So there are people out there. There are Ray Fowlers. There are Paul Peppies out there who say, kid, you have an idea. Don't stop. And then there's 99% of people who will call you stupid, never going to do it. Stop while you're ahead. You're a loser. I don't want to talk to you. Don't email me. Don't call me. I'm not going to invite you to the party. Okay. That happened for many years in my career. Um, but we never, we never stopped because internally I knew that I was living that nightmare. So I knew that if I was living it, probably many other people were living it as well. So, Peter, really, um, your, yeah. your software was really kind of a hazard prevention software, a, a patient safety software program. Am I, am I 100%, saying that? 100%. 100%. It's cognitive offloading at, at the moment. And, and again, I don't go into this in this talk, but when your heart rate is physiologically out of normal. So if you're a little nervous, you're going on a date, first date, or you're giving a talk and your heart rate's 110, 120, that's probably okay. If your heart rate gets to 150, 160, you're, you're now out of the normal range. And when you're physiologically out of the normal range, you can no longer make eye contact with other individuals, it turns out. When you're coding a child or when you're resuscitating a child and the parents and you cannot lock eyes and make eye contact, they have zero trust in you. And when the parents have no trust in you, the tension in the room goes up and the volume of their voices go up and you lose the room. So it turns out that if you can cognitively offload and know that no one will ever ask me for a dose again or a tube size or a chest tube size or, or anything, right? Then I can manage the room, right? So um, what, what parents tell me after the fact, after we're in the resuscitation room is, and when they, when they tell me a year later or a week later, they say that in that room, everything was calm and you were calm and everybody wasn't talking and it was so quiet in there. And, and they said we had the utmost confidence and that never used to be. It's only because I had to create a system for me where nobody would ever ask me a dose. So yes, Ray, Without um, having this, you as the leader of the ship, as a captain of the ship, you cannot focus, period. Peter, uh, Ellis asked us a question. How do you determine dosages when a child seems to be underweight for her mm -hmm. or his age? That, that, that's a great question. Um, when using age, it's the entry point. So if you get to the scene and the child is 16 years old, but the size of a two-year-old, you have to use a length-based tape. So 
the length-based tape doesn't go away. It's just a secondary option rather than the primary option. If you use the length-based tape as the primary option, you can only start figuring out doses when? When you're in front of mom and dad. However, if you know the age before the child's in front of you, and in EMS, we know that, you now can start making those calculations prior to arrival. Therefore, your heart rate is low, lower prior to arrival as an as a EMS professional. And then you're walking up to the scene and you're not looking away from the parent, you're looking at them. It's that first moment in time where you now have control of the scene as opposed to getting there, being nervous, not looking at them, they start yelling, you start yelling, and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and then you wanna leave. So it turns out paramedics wanna leave the scene before they get to the scene. This small little detail is huge. It's, 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 like, it's, it's like maybe the biggest thing, um, it, it's like, you know, the most simple details have the most dramatic impact that's the hidden little secret that, um, that, that, that's out here is that if I'm, if I'm in the emergency department and you say, hey, Pete, three-year-old coming in, cardiac arrest. Well, I know the dose of epi is 1.5 cc's. I'm done. I'm good. All day long, bring them in, right? I'll take care of those kids. So yes, so, so the app, and I, I have a quick little video just so people understand what the app does. It's customized so that the Dallas app will reflect only the Dallas drugs and the Davie Florida app will, re will, will have only the Davie. Uh, so it's very highly customized. Um, it takes about a month or two to get the agency up and running, but you just tap on it, you have the dose. And the beauty of it is, is that when we do drips, uh, there's, a, there's a metronome on here, all the equipment is there, everything is customized. So every single drug, dose, equipment is exactly based on what that agency or hospital carry. Um, and then with one press of a button, you, you actually send it and it goes into the paramedics record or into Cerner or Epic. Um, so, and you can see how, how, how long that takes. And over time, we integrate with, you know, these leading um, um, what we call EPCR. So if you're a paramedic and you, 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 you have to document the software of your patient record, it goes right from our phone app into their record within about a, a couple of seconds. And that, that type of collaboration and integration is what really made us get to the next level in, in, in the company. So much so no, now that we're in all 50 states and over 1300 cities. Um, and every year we have about 360,000 uses of the application. That's actual people that's being used on. So um, it, it's, it's come a long way. Um, but years ago, uh, it, it was it was much more difficult than that. So uh, I hope that answered the question. So Peter, let me uh, quick comment. Um, you and I are EMS medical directors. Medics, by and large, have a high school education, perhaps some college, and mm -hmm. a bit over a year of additional training to take care of every emergency of every age group, gender, language at all hours. Uh, in the afternoon on Wednesday and in the blowing snow at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. <laughs> and we, as medical directors, would you say it's pretty safe to say that one of the highest chances for error is to ask a medic to compute a dosage of a medication in their head? Right. Uh, you know, that, that, that is it. You hit it right on the head. I will take anyone to dinner if when in the middle of a code, resuscitation, if, and there's data on this, if you can ask someone to do a simple math calculation, that's not two times two, um, they cannot do it. It is physically impossible. And by the way, we don't carry calculators and we don't carry pen and pencil. So you know what happens? They don't do it. Or they do a quick calculation in their head to give the wrong dose. And then when we document that same patient who got that medication at 12 midnight, we document at two in the morning or maybe at nine in the morning, the way we document the record, we don't document what we gave. We go to the protocol, we say, what should we have given for that five-year-old? Oh, and then we do the math because now there's no stress. And so the medical director, when if I'm evaluating the chart to look for an error, I'm not finding it. 
I'm only going to find it if I, I'm, I'm, I'm knowing what was, was given at the scene. But that was never documented. So, yes, Ray, you hit it right on the head that it is Russian roulette. Russian roulette. If you're going to try and have someone do a, math, a complicated math equation on the scene and forget about cardiac arrest, seizure, that scares a lot of people, right? Kids got a femur fracture or, or a humeral fracture and they're screaming in pain and you have to give them a fractional dose of a drug that, that requires a fraction to, to calculate, good luck, never gonna happen. So I'll, I'll, I'll continue here to say that, I, you know, now I know why I've been put on this earth. Why? Because what I recognize that since 1980, the survival in pediatric out of hospital cardiac arrest, like the video that we started seeing, there is no change in the outcome, zero for many, many, many years. I'm gonna get into that on the next talk and go a little deeper into that, but we have figured out why. And it has nothing to do with whether you have a high school degree or a college degree, because you could bring me a university professor and you could bring me a 13 year old kid and I'll make that 13 year old kid better at resuscitation in about an hour. And we've proven that in about an hour, I will take you from, from, from never treating a patient to being able to resuscitate a child without any medical school, right? And we've proven that now. So that, that, that is the mission that I'm on. And so the, the adults, they get great bystander CPR, great telephone CPR. In EMS, they know the dose, they pre-plan, they know everything. We stay on scene, we get, we, we get pulses back, which is what ROSC means, return of spontaneous circulation. But in kids, it's different. No one gives by or less people give bystander. The, the, the 911 operator is nervous. We have no plan because we had the tape, we had to get to the scene. Then they throw the kid to us at the curb. And then we got to do math. I'm going to Parkland. It's only five minutes away, but guess what? Nothing was done for that kid. That kid in the hot tub could have been saved on the scene. Now he lands himself in a pediatric all-star hospital where no one can save him because it's too late. It's too late, right? So we know the problems now. We just have to go fix it. So to end this part of the talk before we take a little break, and this is kind of where the little uh, fun part of it comes in. Um, my, I, I told you about my brothers um, who for years kept saying, hey, God, hey, Pete, it looks like you're doing a little bit better. Uh, you know, we still don't think you got a shot in hell. <laughs> anyway. um, but uh, to end the story, I love my brothers. Um, and it turned out that they ended up, you know, ra raised by the same parents. And we, I guess we had the same, um, uh, the same indoctrination as, as kind of just keep moving forward and growing things. They, they grew their company very, very large. And this is public information I'm about to share. Um, but they, they sold their company for quite a lot of money. Um, and so now the, the joke is, is that I am our poor son, the doctor. <laughs> so I'll end, I'll end there uh, just to tease my brothers a little bit. But uh, let's, let's go for some Q&A and then we can trans transition to uh, another topic. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey. That was, uh, I'm sure that was very inspiring for many of the students watching tonight. So uh, we have a, a good number of questions. Um, so uh, the first one here that I'm looking at, it says, if you go to medical school outside of the US, does it make it harder to get a job or placed in residency uh, in the US? How would you recommend overcoming this? Go, that's what I would say. If you're committed, so I'll give you a good story. A friend of mine calls me up and he says, Pete, I can't get into medical school. I said, go to Grenada. So I, I made a couple of phone calls. And this guy's a bright guy. He goes to Grenada. He is now the head of transplant surgery at Wash U in St. Louis. It doesn't matter where you came from. It matters who you are. Don't, I mean, remember, I always carried that chip on my shoulder. And when I was at the University of Miami, I always thought that I had something to prove. Um, and so I told you, I was always the underdog, but I wasn't trying to prove anybody wrong. I was following my heart. I was following my dream. Um, I was driven by the fact that I wanted to be in this profession. So if you have the right 
driver, right? I mean, if you're saying I want to drive a Mercedes Benz and that's why I want to go to medical school, people like Dr. Fowler, when they interview you, they see that written all over your face, right? So that's my answer. Do what you're meant to do, not what your parents told you you should do. Right. It also depends on you yourself. Are you willing to put the work in? Because someone who just slides along and just kind of makes average grades is not going to be able to be demonstrating a commitment. One of my really close friends was a paramedic near me uh, when I was working back in Georgia almost 40 years ago. Uh, couldn't get into medical school uh, in Tennessee where he was from. So he went down to Guadalajara where he learned Spanish, <clears throat> excuse me, there uh, in class. He ended up number one in the class, came back, finished medical school in Georgia and ended up chief of surgery at Erlanger Medical Center. So it just depends on your commitment and your work ethic. Amen. That's right. And so uh, another question related to that one, I guess, is is there a difference in certification or validity of medical degrees from other countries to any extent? Um, there seems to be many conflicting opinions nowadays is what this student is, is wondering. Well, I mean, may, maybe Dr. Farrell has a better sense of that. Remember, I graduated from University of Miami in 1999. That's a long time ago. I can tell you that um, um, getting into the United States system, meaning that for your third and fourth years of medical school, you, you, you probably want to be somewhere in the U.S. stateside. There are schools that have very good relationships with those residencies. And a lot of them are in New York. Um, I, I know there's some here in Florida where you know that if you're going to go to one of those schools off of the mainland, that they have such good relationships that in third and fourth year, you will be dropped somewhere in the United States. You will do third and fourth year medical school. And then it's up to you how well you're going to do and you can make it to do anything. Now, if you're telling me you're going to go to some university that has zero relationship with the United States residency, and you have to do all of your training in medical school, third and fourth year, which is the clinical years, outside of the United States, I do think you will have a harder time getting into a residency here. So Dr. Fowler, maybe you can help me with that, if that's still true or not. Absolutely, and moreover, if you do your residency outside the United States, it, it can be quite yeah. difficult for you to get into the country. I'm working with someone right now that completed um, uh, uh, medical school and an emergency medicine residency in an Asian country is board certified in that country, but wants to be in America and frankly is going to have to start over and find a residency spot. So it's important. You've got to focus. There are a dozen things you have to do from interviews to letters uh, to shadowing and so forth. And so you've got to put work ethic in to get it done. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Whoever asked that question. Yep. Um, and so to kind of flip the page on this, so to be a pediatric emergency doctor, uh, do you do pediatrics and then emergency pediatrics, or do you have to do emergency medicine and then emergency pediatrics? I would say that the former, like you said, peds and then PDR is, is the more common route um, there are people who do emergency medicine, which is a three or four year residency, as you know, depending on where you go. And then they get the bug of, I want to be a pediatric ER doc. And so they can then convert into doing that. Here's why that doesn't happen. And, and that, now we're going to get into, I don't know if we want to get into the salary part of it, but adult EM makes more than pediatric EM. It's just because with adults, they build, they build higher and pediatrics, they build lower and that's just how it is. So to do adult EM residency, to be able to get out and make a lot of money, to then say, I wanna go do two more years of a fellowship to then make less money, doesn't make a lot of sense. So more than likely you're doing PEDS, PDR, and then you do PDR. Now I ended up fortunately going into EMS. So I'm now a medical director for um, a, a number of systems where I'm fortunate to work with over 2000 paramedics. Today that requires a fellowship, typically after emergency medicine fellowship, after emergency medicine residency, you do one year of VMS 
and you can become a board certified EMS medical director. I thankfully, because I've been doing it for more than five years, I just took the exam and I became triple board certified. So PEDS, PDM, and now EMS. And now mainly what I do today is EMS. And I'm, I transitioned away from the pediatric ER or else I'm still on the roster, but I'm not, I'm not doing that as much um, as I used to do. Well, thank you for that. Um, and so the, another student has asked, actually, I want to be an emergency pediatrician and specialize in child abuse. Do you have any advice for me or have experienced child abuse victims in your practice? Absolutely. Well, God bless you for, for saying that. Um, there is a subspecialty where you can go into pediatrics and then become an expert in child abuse, right? If you wanna go into pediatric emergency medicine, then, I mean, you could do both, don't get me wrong, but um, in, in pediatric, in the pediatric emergency department, you have to be very, very in tuned, very in tuned to things like abuse. Um, you, you know, we have all these issues of, uh, of kids being, um, um, you know, move, moved around the country with people who are not their parents. And uh, um, uh, the word is escaping my head right now, but um, you have to be very in tune with a lot of different things. So in the pediatric ER, you're a specialist, Ray, as Ray said earlier, about everything. You're a hematologist, you're an oncologist, you're a GI doctor, you're an abuse specialist, but you haven't been trained in all of those things. But during the six years of your training, three of peds, three of pediatric ER, you could take a couple of extra months and work with the child abuse team. And I would recommend going to a place where the experts are there, right? So Children's of LA, we had the, the most phenomenal people in Pittsburgh, we had phenomenal people. So just during those years of training, you learn more than you need to on, on, on recognizing child abuse, which is, you know, it's unfortunately a very big problem in our, in our, in our communities. So great question. Sure, thank you. Um, and so here we have another question that says, uh, what do you think is the hardest part of being a pediatric emergency physician? Would you say it's the kind of cases you see, such as non-accidental trauma, cancer, terminal illness, or parents who are difficult to deal with? I can tell you that I, I've cried many nights, both in the emergency department with families and at home, uh, when I come home to my, my house. Um, and I, I could tell you that um, that's the hardest part, but it's the best part, right? Because, you know, it's not often that children die, thankfully. So more often than not, you are, you are um, really helping people. People who are at the worst moment in their lives, you're able to help them, turn them around, give them a smile, even when the times are tough. Um, and so, you know, that, that turns out to be, the, you know, even though they're hard, it's the best time. The, the part that was the hardest for me, to be quite honest with you, was that once I got married and had kids, that the moment that my kids knew that daddy wasn't gonna be home, that dad wasn't at the baseball game, the soccer game, that I couldn't be at a family dinner, that, that was hard for me. And so, um, you know, now today, my schedule is different because I'm not doing those shifts anymore. And I'm able to spend time with my family whenever I want. And so if you go into this field, when you're single and you're first into it, I mean, I, I wanted to do a million shifts. At around the 10 year mark is when you know, you, you start to say, boy, this is not easy anymore. Doing overnight shifts, working. I remember every two out of the four big holidays, I have to work two out of the four. So I, I had to pick Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's. You know, I had to pick a couple of days of each of those holidays. That's where it becomes hard. And in the emergency department, as all of you know, if you're not working, you're not making money. And if you're not making money, you can't pay the bills. Um, and, and, um, that, that's where the hard part comes in over time. So what I would recommend everybody do, you see someone like Dr. Fowler, how many things he does from research to administration uh, to you know, helping students. I mean, he's doing so many things that, cause he's, I mean, 
wiser than everyone you'll ever meet. He's able to handle all that. But you need to do something in parallel that makes you wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I'm doing a shift. But when I'm not doing a shift, I can't wait to do this. And that this has to be something that you, you can do until the cows, until you're 120 years old. It could be an administration. It could be that you founded a company. It could be that you got into technology. Uh, it could be that you're a bench researcher. Um, it, it could be a million things. Don't rely on your clinical life to be your life. Because as you get, as you become that expert and you have that ceiling and you say, okay, I've, I've done it all. I can resuscitate a rock, right? Um, what do I do next? If you don't have something that there is a next for, you're done. And then, you're, then you start to go over the hill in your career satisfaction. And there are lots of people in, in, in medicine who can buy down their shifts, meaning that you tell the university, look, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And therefore, instead of doing 18 shifts a month, I want to whittle that down to 10, 8, 6, 4. But I'm doing all these other things. And the university says, you go for it. Uh, so whether you're working at a big academic center or a community hospital, don't do it just for the money. Do it. Do, go find something that you're passionate about. And again, you have to look in the mirror for that. You, you will find someone. You will meet the next person. You'll hear the next lecture that will make you understand who you are, what you're meant to do, and then you do that. Even if it makes you no money, do it. Do everything for free. Don't, don't go looking to, to, to make money giving lectures. Just do what your heart tells you to do, and that next door will be there, and you walk through it. That's what I know. The term is really a compelling interest, Peter. You know, Love uh, that. yes. I, I was sitting, if you sit in the bar at the faculty club at the university, occasionally a Nobel laureate will walk through, and I got to know one of them who invented, who discovered the LDL receptor. And I got to know him, and I asked him one day, so Mike, um, are you ever going to retire or are you just going to be found stiff and cold in your office one day? <laughs> and he said, uh, and I said, no, really. And he said, Ray, don't ever retire unless you have a compelling interest at home. And boy, I realized how right he is about that, you know, because my, my personal, I'll shut up with this, Peter, my personal interests are so compelling surrounding medicine because there's so many op opportunities like you showed that, Oh, that moving video. I, I had to get a handkerchief when you were showing that, you know, of the public knowing what to do when a kid drowns mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so forth. You know, all the opportunities to be able to get true compelling interests uh, and to improve public health wherever we turn. Great. And, and I mean, I love I, I love what you just said. And I hope the people who are listening today, um, you may be, I, I know there's a lot of young people there. Just FYI, I didn't recognize what, what I really was passionate about until I had made the mistakes, until I recognized that, hey, maybe there was something that I could fix and I had the fixer brain. So I, and all of a sudden I started to recognize that I love this and maybe I am the guy for this. And I was well into my thirties. I mean, I'm 48 now, almost 49. So don't be sitting there thinking, my God, I should be, I should be figuring out how I'm going to save the world tomorrow. No, because one day you'll figure it out and you're going to have a choice of either to do it or to just go back to work and do what you keep on doing. Take the chance is what I'm trying to tell you. Take the chance and, and, and make a difference um, that, that may bring one more person back to life or put a smile on the next person's face. I think that that's the key there. Um, no one's got to follow the same path that we follow because um, that's quite impossible to do, right? So, so Peter, we've both made mistakes in medicine and perhaps we've had some bad outcomes from that. Um, yeah. How'd you handle when something went wrong? Did you beat yourself up? Uh, did you oh my God, have trouble yeah. sleeping? You have to go see a shrink? I mean, how'd you handle it? I could tell you that till today, the cases that I screwed up on years ago, I'll never, I'll never forgive myself. And what, what I'm doing today and being able to share my story here today and trying to fix the problem 
is never going to erase those memories, but it's, it's kind of building a wall around those bad memories to say, like, for example, two days ago, we had a, um, a cardiac arrest save in Palm Beach County. And uh, we happened to be in Atlanta for EMS World. And um, I got the phone call and um, it, it was like, it, it, it brought me so much joy of what, what, what happened that, because they stayed on scene, they did everything right. And then our EMS captain drove back to the scene because it was the neighbor who did CPR on the child. He knocked on the guy's door and he said, because of you, that child is alive, right? So the fact that that's happening, right? It's healing to me a little bit. I still get emotional about it um, because, yeah, I'll never heal from the mistakes that I've made because uh, I know I could have done better in a lot of situations. But um, what drives me today is that nobody else makes the mistakes that I made and that if there's another kid out there who's in trouble right now, that we can fix that. Um, and so I will give a talk anywhere. I'll travel anywhere. Um, I'll do anything that I can to make that happen. And so th that's how I heal. Um, I probably needed to go to a shrink. Um, the first time I did Ray is after Parkland. So as you know, I'm the medical director for Coral Springs Parkland. And I was on the scene that day and three of the kids who were murdered that day, I knew their parents. Okay. And um, that's the first time that I needed to see a shrink, right? Because that was, uh, you know, as tough as it gets. Um, but yeah, th th this is, uh, you know, I don't come home and talk to my wife about these things. I don't tell her about cases. Um, I, it's, I just, just kind of I keep all these things in. Um, I, I handle it and I thought I've done a pretty good job, uh, but I'm not gonna lie to you. There are many nights I go check on my kids in the middle of the night to check if they're breathing or not, right? So we're, we're all a little screwed up in that way. Just, that's just part of, the, part of the, 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 the profession. Peter, the amazing thing, and I've known you so long is that you haven't even begun to touch on all the stories you have. And if we don't get you moving on out of this question and answer phase, you'll never get to your stories. So why don't you go okay. ahead and uh, take, okay. take, take, uh, take, you need to get some water or no, I'm good. water the garden I'm good. or you doing all right? All right. Well, rock I'm, and I'm roll. doing rock, good. Rock and roll. Okay. So let me, um, let me go ahead and share this slide. Let me see here. Hold on. Uh, I, I gotta, I gotta. I gotta fix this real quick. Let me let me play this in a window. Hold on, and say play. Okay, now I'm gonna share. All right, we're, now we're gonna get to uh, part two here. <laughs> All right. So this is a, a um, you know a bit of a continuation, and I, I I jokingly kind of put this treating kids like little adults because we we're never supposed to do that, right? Kids are not just little adults. But I, I wanna take you into some concepts here. Um, and the best way to start this off is by talking about uh, someone that some of you may have heard of, uh, Dr. Ignatz Semmelweis, who's an OB guy back in the 1800s. And it turns out that he found out that when he was examining these pregnant women in his clinic, him and his colleagues in the same clinic, within weeks, they were dead. And he, he did something that not many people do. He started collecting the data and he, he finally put the pieces of the puzzle together to get to this, which is he had two clinic days, Monday and Tuesday. Turns out that on the Monday clinic, there were twice as many people dying, women dying from sepsis, meaning um, from infection than on the Tuesday clinic. And he said, oh my God, the reason they're dying is not, is, is not just because that's how it is. There's something happening between Monday and Tuesday. So um, it turns out that on Monday, they would go to the morgue, all the doctors, they would cut open the dead bodies to practice how to do C-sections. And they come to the clinic with their bare hands, no gloves, and they would infect these women and he cultured the bacteria of the women, of the women, and he cultured the bacteria of the dead bodies. And guess what? Same bacteria. So he had an idea, an amazingly simple idea in 1847. He says, we're going to start giving everyone chlorine. The doctors, you have to wash your hands with chlorine before you start to examine the women. And look what happened. 
boom, everything went to zero, right? Women stopped dying. Now there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram or Twitter, but he wanted to tell the world about this new idea. And how many people do you think listened to him? Zero. Not, not only did nobody listen to him, he got fired from the university. He went home and lost his mind, was imprisoned in an insane asylum, was beaten by a guard and died. It was one of the great tragedies that occurred about 20 years before the germ theory was discovered by Koch. Correct. And at the very end of this talk, I was going to say, does anyone know how Dr. Semmelweis died? And I figured you would know that. You're the only person I've ever met that would know that. He died. Semmelweis, Semmelweis was one of my heroes. And I actually have a coin from Hungary with Semmelweis's face on it. But no, I, I'm I, sorry. I, mean, I, I didn't wow. mean to jump your story, Peter. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 no. This, I mean, I, everybody needs to know about this because, folks, today, in 2000, October 12, 2021, there's a lot of things happening in medicine that shouldn't be happening, that we know should not be happening, that will happen for the next 10, 15, 20 years because no one's gonna change it. There are people listening to this call today that will change something in medicine that we've been doing wrong only because they have the will and determination to do that. And so why that's important, and Ray, you'll, you'll know this one too. We had a president that was shot decades after Samuel Weiss figured out that you shouldn't be putting your finger into someone's skin. Who was that president, Ray? Who was the president that got shot in the back? Uh, Garfield? In 1881. Oh, oh, uh, in, oh yes. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. You're right, right, James Garfield. So he was shot at the rail station. He didn't die, he was shot in the back. They brought him to the White House and they brought all these really smart doctors. I think Dr. Pepe, I think he's one of these people in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke. Um, and what did these doctors do? They said, I'll get it out. And they went with their finger and they try to get the bullet out. And guess how James Garfield died? 79 days after he was shot, from sepsis. This, my friends, was about 35 or 40 years after we knew you shouldn't be doing that. How could it be that in healthcare, major discoveries don't make the change? It's because it's in healthcare. So here's the beautiful part of this. If you're listening to this today, tomorrow when you're going to go and do shadowing, you're going to say, oh my God, why are they doing that? You're gonna to turn to the doctor or nurse or PA or NP and they're gonna say, because we've always done it that way. And you should say, got it. And you should go home and you should say opportunity. If you see something so screwed up that someone says we've always been doing it that way, that's your opportunity. Walk through that door, okay? Go do the research, change it, right? So if I, if I make you the city manager and tell you that on this road in your neighborhood, a hundred people die every year, what would you do? And a lot of you are probably thinking, let's put some lights on. And so if you do put lights on this road, here's one thing you have to do. You have to go back the year later and see if the in intervention you did changed anything. Because if you're just gonna make a change for the sake of making a change, shame on you, right? That's what, this is what research is about. This is what data is about. This is why we're scientists. So it turned out on this road, if you did, if you came back a year later after they put the lights on, it turned out 150 people died. Why would 150 people die on a road that's more well lit? Because subconsciously the brain wants to put the gas and continue going around the curve. And it's a mistake to put lights on a curved road. It's a mistake, it turns out, science. That's how you get to the answer. So whatever you do, evaluate it, make an intervention, come back and evaluate the data afterwards. That's real science, okay? And so it turns out that, you know, a lot of what we do, there's a lot of garbage between our two ears. So read this book, because a lot of the change that has to happen in medicine is just, it's a nudge. It's what we call behavioral economics. And just to really quickly prove this, Here's a little child, two-year-old, who has a very fast heart rate, supraventricular tachycardia. I'm not gonna go into the details, but basically this child's heart rate is very, very fast. 
And if anyone's on this call who's a clinician, they automatically see two-year-old and the diagnosis and you start to get nervous. But if I said, wait a minute, it's a 42-year-old, not a two-year-old. They, oh, now I get it. Okay, that's easy. And they know the dose, they know the drug, they know the route, the heart rate goes right back down. So what I learned when I became an EMS medical director is that same diagnosis, same treatment, same algorithm. If I told them 42, they're like, go get them, Tiger. If I said two, that same second they looked away, their heart rate went up and they were in a different zone. And I said, there's something there, there's something there. So it turns out, I'm not gonna go into the science here, into the medicine, but it's the same algorithm for an adult or a kid, right? So there it is, same, same, same. So what happens is that the, the stress of pediatric happens just by knowing it's a pediatric that you're about to go to. That's where the intervention needs to happen. And that's where we can change this curve that I showed you before, which by the way, the data is in the American Heart Association guidelines that if you're an infant, which means you're under the age of a year, you have a very poor chance of survival, a child means you're one to puberty, you have a 10.5%, and an adolescent, well, we treat them like adults. So it turns out that the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival is very, very poor, okay? Now, when you become an EMS medical director, you have to deal with adults and kids, and that was God's way of telling me, look how easy and look how, look how well you can, you can make it for the adults. So Dr. Shecky, who's my colleague, and Dr. Pepe, we, we came into Palm Beach County and within one year, look what we did. 2014, this was the, the, the rate of getting pulses back. We got the job in 2015. Within one year, we doubled it. Why? It's adults. It's easy. It's simple, right? But when I said, what about the, the kid? The, I showed you this graphic before. They said, no, it, it's, it's, it's very different. So I set out to understand what is really different why are we treating the adult in cardiac arrest on a Tuesday this way, but Wednesday, the same crew, the same thing, the same etiology, everything is different? Well, it turns out it's all behavioral. It's all behavioral, it turns out. And so um, it took me many years to understand this problem. Um, I'm not going to get into, into the story of John Robbins because I'll, I'll probably get too emotional, but he got to the scene of a, two, of a two-year-old drowning and they handed the, the kid to him and he, he went to the back of the ambulance and the chief said, the, 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 actually there was the lieutenant, who was the more senior person said, hey, Robbins, you're a rookie. You're a first year guy, you drive. So he gets in the front of the a vehicle, starts driving. It was a gate of community. He made a left and a left, dead end. He passed the house. The parents looked at him he looked at the parents, lights and sirens. He made a right and a right, another dead end. He passes the house a second time. He finally gets out of the neighborhood. He gets to the, to the ER and they ended up calling the code right in front of him. And he ended up leaving the scene, leaving the emergency department crying, never told a soul. And he ended up over the next year trying to uh, kind of figure out what was going on with him. He went into alcohol. He thought about killing himself and doing su and committing suicide. Um, and that, that was a, and he never told anybody for many, many years. So what I learned from, from him is something called the arrest life cycle, which is where if we're not good at knowing what to do before we get there and doing, and, and then doing it right on scene, we'll never get to the most important part of what we do, which is called closure. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, you know, for the 65 year old, before we get there, we know what to do. For the two year old, we don't because we never were taught that way. On scene, the 65 year old, we do everything perfectly. The two year old, we just run to the back of the vehicle and we leave. So then they give us something called the debrief, which is to try to make us feel better. But it turns out if you didn't do these two quadrants the right way, there's nothing I can tell you that'll make you feel better. And then you start to second guess yourself. Now we get to the most important. And so th this may be the most important slide for me because I learned that if, if you want to be a good clinician, when whatever you do, 
You want to get to closure. What does closure mean? Closure means that good or bad, you can go to the mom and dad, look them in the eyes and tell them what you did and without feeling guilty about it because you did everything that you could. If you didn't do it right, it turns out you'll never go look them in the eyes. You'll never want to talk to them. And then that's a little fire burning in 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 the subconscious mind. And over many years of not getting closure, you start to have very bad nights. And I'll raise my hand. We've had those nights. If you can get the closure for yourself, meaning I did a good job, I call that closure part one. You could then turn around and, and help the parents get the closure for their child that they've just lost. That's an important thing. That's an important thing. Um, and so, you know, I want to I want to quickly move into the fact that, you know, if you really want to get kids back to life, we, we showed you the video early on. You have to get lay people involved. You have to get the 911 operator involved. You have to get EMS doing the right thing, staying on scene. Then the hospital has to retrieve and receive that child who now has a pulse and then take the baton. So if you want to get kids back to life in your community, you can't just figure out one of these steps. You have to fix all of these steps. And it turns out these are not that difficult to do because we know how to do them. We just have to convince everyone that it's not that different. I'm not going to get into the audio here because this is very, very kind of emotional to get into. But, you know, if you look at the red bar here, the red bar is of the emotional state of the 911 operator when you call 911 and say, my two-year-old is not breathing. And it turns out that unless they've been trained the right way, they don't want to start CPR because they think that they're going to hurt that child. So we've had to do a lot of training and we've We've nudged them to say a two-year-old who is not conscious, who's not breathing normally, I don't care who they are, what race, religion, or creed, they get CPR, period. That sounds simple, doesn't it? We've had, it took us years to make that happen. It takes listening to every single cardiac arrest call. I had a student who did that. We had them listen to, and we started looking at the data. It turns out that if it's a kid, the dispatcher doesn't want to start CPR. We have to fix that. Okay, so I'm going to... Fire rest. Oh, my God. I'm not going to have you listen to that. But basically, that child, that two-year-old, in my my neck of the woods here, before we fix this problem, went about eight minutes with not one chest compression. But we got there. We did everything right. We got this kid's pulses back. But guess what? The kid died. 36 hours later, because he didn't have any perfusion to the brain, not one chest compression by mom and dad, not one chest compression because of 911. We get there, we do everything right, kid's dead, right? So if you have no layperson CPR and no telephone CPR, you could have the best EMS CPR, and we do, and you still have a bad outcome. So what if I show you this video where it's a team of people in Bangkok where this kid drowned in a river, and look what they did to get him back to life. Those are chest compressions, not that good. Now he puts him on his shoulder and he starts doing the last. I want to say Watch this. Eyes right here. 
Hey, <laughs> Tara. Okay, so I'm, it's funny. I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing people saying, oh my, this is crazy. But guess what? They got this kid back to life. They got this kid back to life. Why? Because the little boy in Palm Beach County that, you, that I, I didn't have you listen to the audio for, he got nothing, zero. It turns out that by putting someone on your shoulder and doing something is more important. So we teach all the same 15 to two, 15 compressions and two breaths if you're two people. And so maybe we should change it. Now it should, it should, maybe it should be 15 compressions and two laps. <laughs> we should change it to that. <laughs> but all joking aside, what did I learn from this? That in America, there's a lot of kids dying before EMS even has a chance to get them back to life, right? Big problem, big problem. So this kid got no EMS CPR, no telephone CPR, really crappy layperson CPR, but we have a Mark Zuckerberg thumbs up, right? I'm not a Facebook fan, by the way. So it turns out that Houston, we have a problem, but that's how we've always done it, they say. That's how we've always done it. Oh no, oh no. Well, people like Mike Levy out in Anchorage, Alaska, and Ben Barbro and the people from the Resuscitation Academy in Seattle said, we need to fix dispatch. And they, and they did. So now, you know, the question I have for you is, which is better, no CPR or any C Well, it turns out any CPR is better. And maybe the way that we train people in CPR is completely wrong today, today, October 12, 2021. So why is bystander CPR important? Well, there's data. And the data shows, this is from Korea, your survival from no, no bystander CPR is not good. If 911 telecommunicator gets you on the phone and convinces you oh, it's better, if you're in Seattle and you see someone not breathing and, you're, and you just start doing CPR without calling 911, well, look, you can quadruple your outcomes just by doing the right thing. So that's why Seattle has the best outcome. It's not because their paramedics are better than anyone else's, it's because the system is better. They train better. They're doing it right. They have everything correct. So this is what we call now no, no, go. Very simple. The dispatcher, when you call 911, after they ask you some basic questions and they find that there's a problem, they say, is the patient awake? Can you wake them up? No. Are they breathing normally? No. No, no, go. Start CPR. How long do you think that should take? Most people would say that should take 10 seconds. Would you believe we looked at our data? Again, I'm going back to the data because we reviewed every audio for adult, pediatric, didn't matter. We were at five minutes to getting hands on the chest. So we measured and then we stole that no, no go and we put it in and we saw the numbers come to four minutes, to three minutes, to two and a half minutes. We're only now at two minutes. We can't get below two minutes still. Hands on the chest, right? but we continue to measure, we continue to improve, we continue to measure, we continue to improve. This is a marathon. So the American Heart Association in 2015 said, you should recognize the rest, which is the two no's. Are they conscious? Are they breathing normally? No, no. That should take a minute. And then you have another minute to get them to start doing chest compressions. You wanna do a quick project, go to your local dispatch center, talk to the medical director and say, I want to help you with a project. I will buy you dinner if it's under two minutes, hands to the chest. Guaranteed it's not under two minutes. We can do better. Okay. There's data. There's a big registry now called the CARES registry. So what do we do now? We input the data of when did they recognize? When did they begin instructions? When did they do first compressions? Now someone created a registry the folks out of Atlanta, Emory University. Th these are people who said we have to do better. They created a registry. This is how we've gotten better, right? By collecting the data. And now every quarter I get a report from my neck of the woods on how my dispatchers are doing. I commend them, we honor them, we bring them chocolate. This is, a, this is how you get better. It's not just by saying, go follow the protocol. You have to get involved. You have to do the right thing. So no, no, go 
which I'll have you listen to this one real quick. And this is how it, it is done correctly. And this is thanks to Mike Levy out in Anchorage. Uh, take a listen to how it's supposed to go. Uh, 8110 Janesta Avenue. The house or apartment? The house. Okay, sure you call from 818-343-0809, is that right? Yes. And what's your emergency? Uh, my mother's not responding at all right now. Are you with her? She, yes. Is she awake? No. Can you wake her up? No. Is she breathing normally? No. Okay, did you get her on the ground? We're going to start CPR. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So what I recognize as an EMS medical director is that all of my adult calls, we were doing that. Boom. Beautiful. All the pediatric calls, we were doing that. And I scratched my head and I said, let's go fix it. Right. So this, this required further investigation and understanding. And if some of you know Bodie Miller, uh, Olymp Olympic skier, this audio allowed me to learn because I, when I heard this audio, I said, wait a minute. That's the same thing happening by me, which is they started CPR, but then they found a reason to stop CPR. So take a listen to the call taker, did a great job starting CPR. Then the dad, not a doctor, not a nurse, not a paramedic said, I, oh, I feel a pulse. And they stopped them from doing CPR and the kid ended up not making it. Take a listen. Keep breathing. Here, here, hold on. Is this in front of the Yes, hurry. Hurry! All right, paramedics, what's the address of the emergency? Okay. What city? Dakota de Casa. Okay, what's the emergency there? Morgan. Morgan. What is the emergency there? What is the emergency? The baby fell in the pool. No, don't stop it. Okay, paramedics are on the way. What's the phone number if they need to call you back? Baby out of the water? Yes. Okay, how old? I'm um, 19 months. Okay, is he breathing? No, a little girl. Okay, do you, is somebody there that knows how to do CPR, knows how to do rescue breathing? Okay, does she have a pulse? Um, she's... Come on, keep going. Okay, does she have a pulse? Her pulse. Okay, are you doing CPR or do you need me to coach you through it? Wait, coach me through it, please. Okay, get the baby on a firm, flat surface. I know CPR. I, 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 I have a small pulse. I have a small pulse. Okay, if she's got a pulse, do not do CPR, okay? Tilt her head back and open her airway and see if she's breathing. Okay, everything you just heard there is completely off script. We don't ask if they have a pulse. We don't depend on the father to tell us if she has a pulse. And so what I learned is that every single call where we started CPR, within seconds, the call taker stopped them to recheck the kid and we never restarted CPR. So it turns out that in the pediatric telephone CPR problems, A, they don't want to start. When you can fix the starting problem, you have the stop problem. So we have to figure that out. And we only figure that out because we put the work in and we listen and we learn and we kept listening. Um, so it, you know, it, it turns out that the layperson CPR is hard to do. Telephone CPR, not so hard. EMS CPR, that was the next thing we had to fix. Um, not so hard to do either. And then the hospital, you gotta bring the kid there alive before the kid's even gonna make it. So what we learned about EMS was something very basic, was that you had to know what to do before you got there. And when you got there, you had to just do what you did for the adult. So when I say treat kids like adults, yes, kids are different. Their head is bigger, their airway is more anterior, their, you know, the surface area is different. There's a lot of differences, but the way that you handle them, the way that you run your CPR, your resuscitation should be the same exact methodology as the adult. That's what I'm talking about. When I say treat them like adults, the yesterday code for the adult, treat the kid the same way and we did it. We figured it out. How did we do that? Take a listen. This is how we practice in route to the scene. This was the golden egg right here. Just telling them what to do before they got there. This was the key that, that, that still today, people don't seem to quite understand the magic of happens before you get there. So take a listen. 
let's first talk about pre-arrival. Before you enter the scene of a pediatric arrest, you have to be mentally ready. Hey, listen, it's a seven-year-old, looks like a drowning. If it's an actual cardiac arrest, you're gonna be airway, you'll be CPR, I'll be monitor and drilling, all right? Uh, since your airway, your kings will be either a 2.5 or a 3, depending on what size it is, but it can go either or, all right? Okay. Uh, defibrillation. The first one's at 50, the rest are at 100. 50 and 100, the rest are the rest. Are, the, rest. the epis are 2.5 mLs, and if they are in fib or they're in VTAC, we'll do amiodarone, and it's 2.5 mL as well. All right, I'm going to drill them right. Okay, so you, you saw how nice that was. It was, it was crisp, it was quick. Now each of them has a role. They're going to get there and they're going to do this. And, and, and we, we practice this maniacally. If, if you come down to Palm Beach County and see how we train, if you're a rookie paramedic and you can't, you can't do this better than any doctor in any hospital, we won't sign off on you. You become expert very, very quickly because we know what we're doing. We know how to train on it. It was pretty, it's pretty amazing. So I'm going to run through this because I know that we have, I, I, like I said, I could talk for a long time, but even, even the gear placement we practice, what just happened there happened for a reason. Um, and I, I'm going to keep going here. Um, what we're here, what I'm going to do is this, I'm going to, um, I'm going to move ahead a little bit guys only because I, I, I want to, I want to get to the end here. And then I, I have some other things that I want to do, but let me, let me take you to, um, to, to some, some of the data here. Um, let me share my screen real quick. <clears throat> so years have gone by. Many people are doing, are, are using this, these techniques that we've put out. And there's a gentleman by the name of Paul Banerjee, Dr. Paul Banerjee in Polk County, middle of Florida, big, big county, a lot of drownings every year. Um, and we, we, we taught him how to do this. The reason he called me is because in 2012 and 13, no child survived. And he says, Pete, come out here. And, and teach me what you're doing. And we, we taught them. And the next year, 13 children are neurologically normal. The next year's two years, 17 children. And so we, we saw that, wow, we're able to move the needle, not by changing the medicine, but by doing behavioral economics and training differently and getting the epinephrine on earlier. This is cardiac arrest epinephrine, one in 10,000 or one milligram in 10 ml. We, we shouldn't be using the one in 10,000 mon um, uh, moniker anymore. And you can see that we're collecting the data and publishing this, that the green, these are the children coming back to life neurologically normal. It doesn't have to be 5%. It could be higher than that. And again, th this was published and you'll see the name Dr. Pepe again, one of my mentors and uh, one of Dr. Fowler's very close friends. Um, th this was published, it was a landmark paper. And just to finish up this segment here, John Robbins was on the brink of suicide, was getting into alcohol, couldn't have relationships with, with people because he was so frazzled. We, we taught him this, with this method in 2015 when I became the medical director. And he came up to me that day that I first met him. And he said, Doc, I hope I never have to use this ever. I said, well, that's unusual. Why would you say that to me? I didn't say it to him out loud. Of course, uh, that same week, he had his 18 month old choking on a grape. He ended up getting the kid, putting the kid on the floor, getting the, um, the, um, the McGill's out, getting the grape. And this kid was brought back to life on the scene. He didn't do what he would have done before, which is run. He got a commendation for it. A week later, he goes on another call where he gets another kid back to life. This family is forever indebted to Jonathan Robbins and they love that they've taken him like a family member because he got another kid back to life. And so when he came to me a few months after this, when I got to catch up with him, he said to me, he looked me in the eyes and he said, doc, he said, he says, my life has been saved. And I said, what do you mean your life has been saved? He says, now I, I finally understand what it means to get to closure. And he is who I learned about closure from because he said, now that I can look parents in the eyes, I know what I'm doing, I do it right. He's like, my life has been saved. And he told me that he was on the brink of suicide. And so when, when it comes to pediatric death, it's part of the job, unfortunately, and you can't ignore it, you can't avoid it. You have to 
feel. You have to be with the families. And there's probably not a better story in the world. And, and maybe we can kind of start to end, uh, or I can go on for another hour if you want me to, but um, with, 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 a, with a, a, a quick video about some special, a special person who really does it the right way. Because pediatric bereavement is not something that happens later. It's helping people cope with the death of their child on the scene, in the emergency department. It's us calling them, me calling them a day or two later. It's me or my admin going to the funeral. It's sending a card and maybe the birthday is not that we've changed this slide. I should change just a, a regular condolence card. Th these are very difficult, uh, very difficult things to do. So let, let's end it uh, on this video of when you talk about people who are just incredible, <laughs> Dr. Fowler is one of those people. Dr. Kupis is another one. And take a listen to what he did on the scene of a patient who was in pediatric, who, who ended up dying in his arms um, in Pennsylvania. But with the, this one case, so we got to the point where it was futile. The grandfather wanted to be with the child as we stopped. And as we were walking to, for him to be with the child, he said, she hasn't even been baptized yet. Well, I can, we can do that for you. And he said, and he was like, his eyes just lit up. He's like, oh, could you? And so, sure. So I went to the kitchen. I got a little cup of water and he was there and we were ready to terminate. Um, but before termination, I did the baptism and, and then we did the field termination. And wow. basically what I did, I, you know, got some of the water, put my hand with the water on it, the baby's head and said, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then after the baptism with the grandfather there, we stopped. The child was in asystole. It was clear they were in asystole. Um, we gave a time of death and that kind of thing. Let him spend a little time just sort of holding the child's hand and holding the child. You know, in the aftermath, we have our people all trained to do things like, you know, obviously call the coroner. We also have them trained to, you know, ask ask the folks, is there anybody we can call for you to help support you? A, you know, a neighbor, a pastor or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we call the pastor, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In this case, the grandfather, after things settled a little bit, said to me, can we get a baptism certificate? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, absolutely. Not mm -hmm. having any clue where I was going to get a <laughs> baptism certificate, but I'm like, oh, absolutely, you know. Mm -hmm. so then I called uh, from the scene to to let their pastor know. I called their pastor, and the guy was on vacation. So then ah. I go back the next day. I call our chaplain service in the hospital, um, ah. and the the woman that um, is like the receptionist and admin for the chaplain service at the time had spent, I had known her for probably five years as one of our desk clerks in the emergency department. And, and I said, I've got a crazy question for you, but I, you know, I did this baptism and I need a baptism. You know, where do you guys, where can I get that? And she said, oh, Dr. Koopas, that's no problem at all. And I didn't even think they do it in the NICU all the time. Professional with a little like gold. Yeah. Print. Um, she said, yeah, I can, you know, give me the name and stuff. We'll print out a certificate. Uh, it's a relatively small town at one of my, uh, several years later at one of my um, kids' science fairs, um, the mother of the child was there and oh. uh, came up to me and thanked me so much and told me how much it meant. Like, you know, a couple years later, she uh. remembered and, and specifically was touched by having that certificate of baptism for their uh, daughter. I think I think there's no better way to to, to end to end that uh, right right there because that epitomizes why we do what we do why all of you are here today why you want to go into this field of healthcare and medicine is to be that person when nobody's watching when no one's going to hear the story but you but you do things because you care you're a servant of the people and uh, we're privileged to be in this position. Um, I'm very fortunate to, to, to be in the position where we can now help lives all around the country and hopefully one day all around the world. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's, that, it's that drive that I hope all of you have inside of you to do that special thing uh, one, one day in your career. So uh, thank you guys for having me and um, I look forward to more Q&A. Peter, what a wonderful story. I mean, you got this old man crying over here. Good grief. <laughs> And, of course, knowing Doug Koopas, folks, uh, the man you just saw speak is the EMS medical director for the entire state of Pennsylvania. And so one of the true 
leaders in the history of our field. Peter, that was just, the whole presentation was magnificent. You got, um, are you up for just a handful of questions? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm yours. Cheyenne, take it away. Yes, sir. So we have a few over here. So um, I guess one of the questions that might uh, be related to what we were just discussing. Um, is there any overlap between pediatric and neonatal emergency care? Oh, absolutely. Um, neonatal emergency care, remember that the, there's, a, there's a different set of guidelines for, for, for the newborn, uh, for the neonates. Uh, so maybe in other words, um, you may have a different ratio of, of how you would resuscitate them. Um, the principles are effectively the same but obviously they're shrunken down quite significantly. So there is an entire specialty dedicated to those children. So for example, in the emergency department, I'm never in the delivery room uh, resuscitating a newborn. However, if that child goes home and on day four or eight or 10 decides to not do well, then I surely am resuscitating a newborn, right? Um, once you got, once you get down to the really preemie children, the children who are born preterm underweight, uh, it, it's again, there's, there's different things that you would do based on if it needs surfactant, uh, you may put a different type of central line in, um, you know, however, the principles of resuscitation, uh, don't change globally. However, they do change because of the fact that, um, the children are smaller and we, we may do things a little bit differently, but the answer is if you wanna go into that field, you would do three years of pediatrics and three years of neonatology. And then you would be that person in the neonatal ICU handling the tiniest of the tiniest. Personally, I'm not built for that, uh, but there are many people who would never leave that space to come to where the bigger kids are. Yeah, right. great question. Sure, thank you. Um, and so, uh, another question uh, that some of our students is wondering or wondering, um, uh, how does the path to pediatric surgical oncology look? Um, uh, what's the mm. pathway to that field? Yeah, so sur pediatric surgery is entirely different, right? Uh, you have to go through the surgical subspecialties to, to end up in pediatric surgery. And then an offshoot of that is an additional year or so, maybe year or so of of surgical oncology. So although there are many pediatric surgeons who will, will do onc cases as pediatric surgeons, but the bottom line is, is that your, your route into pediatric surgery is through surgery, not through pediatrics. So, um, and people do pediatric surgery. I mean, they, they, they tend to be just incredible people from um, their clinical acumen to their um, their, their dexterity, their bedside manner. Um, you don't have any upset, angry pediatric surgeons. These are the nicest people you will find who are um, just amazingly skilled. So in my opinion, that's the cream of the crop in surgery is pediatric surgery. Thank you. Uh, and I'll leave you with, uh, with this one last question here so I don't take up too much of your time. Um, but this last question here is, uh, did you happen to notice issues in medicine like this when you were in medical school? Uh, this as in, you know, the, uh, uh, the whole, you know, system you know, as a whole. Uh, yeah. Or uh, did you ever get to witness such a change in the system with the attendings before you began your journey? I surely have had many mentors. But, I, but I, you know, um, I will tell you is that um, it took me a while to learn that I think differently and that actually maybe that was something that I could use in the real world, right? Um, and so when I was in Grenada, I remember putting together these study guides that no one had ever seen a study guide like that before. And next thing you know, everybody was buying them from me. Uh, I mean, for the cost of the printing, I wasn't selling them kind of thing. Um, and it didn't even hit me then that, uh, so over time, I had zero confidence. I started gaining my confidence. And then one day when I, after I created this hand heavy thing, only years later, once I recognized that, wait a minute, people aren't believing in me, but I, I truly do believe in myself. And then it turns out now in retrospect that things that I was doing were right. Now, as I gotten older, 
I can look back and say, hey, you were like that before. Um, now, now I just understand now when I see something and it, it seems like a winner to me. Uh, so there are a lot of things that I'm doing now that we haven't talked about that if it hits me in the core that I know it's right, I'll go after it and I'll do it. And turns out most of those times people think I'm crazy. And when I hear people thinking I'm crazy, I say time to put the gas. Cause now I know the pattern of no one's doing it. I think it looks pretty cool. I'm going to keep on doing it. So now, now I know that pattern um, and um, now I'm using it to my benefit. So uh, you have to learn about who you are and what you do, I think, over time. That's how I would answer that question. <laughs> well, 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 Peter and Teddy, what a wonderful talk. You know, you've we've been so blessed. You're our 73rd speaker and you are the top of the group, man. That was just terrific. So oh, moving. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Peter, um, we'll place this online and okay. probably 5,000 people, uh, healthcare <laughs> professionals will watch this. Each one of them will see 100,000 uh, patients in a lifetime. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. Peter, with this two hours <laughs> you were so kind to give us tonight, you touched a half a billion lives. And I hope that that gives you a sense of warmth and also a, a tiny a tiny fragment of the gratitude we have for you being with us. Uh, I would well, like well, ask. Every, I, I, I would ask wait, everybody to before please put, before you yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not. We're be, not before, okay. okay. I want to ask I'll, everybody okay, go to ahead, put. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask you everybody to put thank you, Dr. Antevi, into the chat so he can see hundreds of you saying thank you for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. So there they are, Peter. They're. Uh, letting you know what they thought about this wonderful, wonderful Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And um, so, uh, Cheyenne, give this and then turn it right back to me when you're done. Sure, of course. So, uh, as always, we do have our post-session uh, assessments here. This is assessment number 73, and that's the QR code for it. Um, a link will also be sent to your email. Uh, so this will be due October 19th at 6.59 p.m. Central Time. You'll have two attempts and you must receive a score of at least 70% uh, in order to receive the credit for attending. So, and, yeah. Well, thank you, Cheyenne. And uh, Peter, on behalf of the whole working group of virtual shadowing, we again want to thank you for your grace and your kindness of coming to us tonight and, and giving us this marvelous message. Well, everyone out there, thank you for being here, all 250 of you that came tonight. Um, uh, we're going to keep being here if you keep coming back. So on behalf of Dr. Antevi and the whole virtual shadowing team, we want to wish you a good evening and a good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys so much for having me. You guys are incredible.